Hello and welcome. I'll be talking today about the state of open source license clarity. My name is Philippe Omredan and I have one weird fact about me. Um, I signed off of uh, one of the largest deletion of lines of code in the Linux kernel. Um, but these were actually not really lines of code. These were commands and license commands. And so I'm very good at that, at deleting lines of commands in code. I maintain primarily uh, open source tools that help uh, discover where code comes from and what's the license and whether there's security issues. And, and, and so that's what I do both uh, from a community and, and business perspective. So we'll be looking at these topics today. The first thing that's really important is why you should care about license and licensing. I think that license is the essence of free and open source. I mean, without licenses, there wouldn't be any free and open source software at all. That's what defines it. And it's, it's really the getting item to, to open source. Now, I can fix bugs. I can patch vulnerabilities. But even if I have the code, I cannot fix the license, right? Uh, only the, the authors can do that. So that's really important to just let that sink in for a second. License is really the essence of free and open source software. Now, if you dive down a, a bit lower, if the license information is not clear, then uh, it's harder for everyone to consume uh, free and open source software. It's, it's true if you're an open source project and you care about the GPL, you want to make sure that the code that you would depend on or integrate in your own uh, tool uh, has a license that's compatible with the GPL. Or uh, the same is true for any kind of a commercial proprietary endeavor uh, where you would reuse software. You want to make sure you, you're allowed to use that. And I think that in contrast with proprietary software where every single license contract is something unique, uh, part of the success of free and open source software has been that we've developed licensing norms. If I say Apache or GPL or BSD, it's clear and well understood in terms of meaning. There's no need to think and read lengthy contract and legalese. And that's really big, been a big win. So anytime there's a problem with licensing clarity, I think everyone is losing. Be, be it you as a code author or a consumer of the code. So what, what does it mean really to, to have some lack of clarity? What about a package that says I'm redistributable? Right? That's not super useful. It used to be common in uh, RPM packages in the past um, to say, well, this is redistributable. Or there's no license at all, which is unfortunately a more common uh, uh, occurrence. Or if we look at older kernel thermal drivers, um, you can be funny or witty. Uh, it says you distribute your code under the terms of the general public license. This has been fixed. It's actually something I, I discovered when we when clean, cleaned up the kernel. Uh, but this is a kind of problem at scale that creates ambiguities. Uh, is this really the GPL or not? And it may trip some tools that will be looking for patterns such as uh, under the term of the GPL, right? Here, the term and the terms would be two different patterns. Or it can be obfuscated at time. This has been seen in a module license uh, where GPL was written in ASCII, meaning that you cannot really read that stuff, right? You have to interpret the, the ASCII or run the code. So all these contribute to the lack of clarity in licensing. And so the other thing is that there's really an explosion of the number of uh, third party packages we depend on. If you think about uh, a node package, uh, it's common place to have several hundred packages that are pulled in as dependencies of the application you, you may be running using, uh, you may be building using JavaScript. 
or if you use Docker containers, you are effectively integrating hundreds or thousands of system packages on top of application packages together with your code in the Docker image. And each means you have thousands of copyright holders and thousands of potentially different licenses. And, and so re really we're reaching a point where open source is widely reused and it's essential, yet at the same time, the volume we're dealing with demands that we, we put in place some, some automation. And beyond automation, having clarity in licensing is going to be the only practical way to uh, know what the license you, you're dealing with and how to comply at, at any scale. Because otherwise, you're, you're going to spend a lot of time just figuring out what is the license of this piece of code. And remember, as I said earlier on, this is essential. You need to know first what is the license of a piece of code before you, you're, you're, you're able to do anything with it. So in an ideal world, uh, this, this presentation, this talk shouldn't be taking place, right? The provenance and licensing of all the third party packages that you use in uh, any piece of code should be able to, to be discovered with uh, structured metadata and that's all clear and jolly and there's no, no ambiguity whatsoever, all right? Again, because it's important for everyone to know that information. And we should really know it all. Um, I've, I've made a study, and that's part of the, the doc uh, topic today, about the license documentation found in, in roughly 5,000 uh, open source packages, application packages. So things like uh, RubyGems, PyPy packages, Maven, uh, Node. And Less than 5% of 5,000 of these did contain what I would say a quasi-perfect, complete and unambiguous li license uh, documentation. And that's troubling because really what this means is eventually there's 95% of these packages that would need to get some review before you can effectively use them uh, without risk to uh, not comply with license because you don't know what are the license terms. Now, how do you get about collecting license information? So there's many different ways. Um, one is to uh, get structured information from what's called package manifest. You know, if you use Python, you're going to create a setup.py script which can contain the license tag, which is a, a structured information about what the license is. The same happens for Ruby with uh, uh, gem spec files or Node with package.json or Maven with the Maven POM. Each of these have uh, placeholders where you can put a structured information about original license. In some cases, these are build scripts, so they, they combine both uh, the, the build and the metadata aspect of the package. That's the case for, um, for instance, uh, RPM spec files or Gradle build scripts, uh, or they can be fully dedicated to licensing like Debian copyrights. All of these are package manifests and, and they can provide with explicit license information. Beyond that, we have license files text files, like a copying file, uh, notices, tags that may exist, such as the SPDX license identifiers. We'll come back on that in a second. And all of these uh, are present in different places. They can be in top level files. They can be inside the code in various documentation. And there's a lot of different uh, indirect provenance clues that can be used also. If you find a URL saying, hey, I copied this code from Stack Overflow, um, would be a good example of a common clue that there's code from a third party origin that may uh, have some uh, well-known license attached. And there's a lot of other techniques, but these, these are the key ones. And again, I'm focusing here, not about finding uh, code reused directly, but finding license of that code. 
So if we look specifically at package manifest, so that's the first technique I was uh, mentioning, and it's uh, structured metadata. And the, the thing is that in practice, unfortunately, uh, as much as we want to have that information clear and upfront, because that's the first obvious piece of information, you have a, a field in a data file that says license GPL, that's very useful, right? It's very obvious. It's clear, concise, and unambiguous in, in many cases. So the, the problem is that only a subset of these packages contain uh, proper provenance declared information. We call that declared when it comes at the top. So for the Clarifying project, uh, I evaluated the, actually we evaluated the clarity of uh, license uh, documentation for, as I said, about 5,000 of the most popular free software package. So popularity is actually something difficult to figure out, but we came with a few heuristics um, and, and came out with a list. And so the average license clarity score uh, for these are about 45 out of 145%. That means literally it's pretty cross, right? It's below, below par. Uh, and below below uh, half of uh, the, the score uh, apportionment. And we had only 194 out of roughly 1,000 that had a score above 80. And score above 80 being something which would be like considered as, as uh, being uh, uh, something which would be great documentation. But not perfect, just great. And so that's the, the first thing that's that the information is not really always there. The second thing is license that we can find in code and text. So that's where you, you come with what's called scanning. And there's different techniques for, for that. Uh, the best one is uh, the third one, which I think is the most comprehensive and which extends to doing a pairwise comparison of all the license and text samples you can find against all the files you have in your code base. And it's it's better because it's uh, uh, it's perfect, it's a diff. It's in, in legal terms it would be called a, a legal red line. There's other techniques which are used by other tools than mine, such as pattern matching and probability stacks. Uh, actually, I, I use all these and I think the, the best tools should and would use all these three techniques together to ensure that you, you don't leave uh, any license behind. So what do we mean really by license clarity? It's pretty much uh, intuitive. If you think about a package that would have a clear license in its package manifest declared at the top level, so that's one. Second, all the license would be uh, documented in the code or in the files uh, when it's possible with either a notice or an SPDX license identifier. That's two. This license at the file level would be the same as the one declared at the top level. Yeah, these, these are consistent and that's important. It's more often than not, uh, not the case and that's a problem. So that's three. Third, we'd be using well-known licenses, not kind of a less travel thing and unknown quantity that would require review. Um, so I know about the GPL, uh, I know about uh, the BSD, the Apache license and so on. There's roughly a thousand different open source license and uh, there's definitely some which are much less known than others. And so the, the proxy we use here is would be to say, is it a license that's been referenced at SPDX, knowing that SPDX also uh, covers all the license from the Free Software Foundation license list, all the software license from uh, the OSI and from the Federal East. So it's been it's pretty comprehensive for the most common well-known license. So that's four. And last, most of the license have a simple requirement at the minimum, which is make sure the license text is present somehow. And is the license is present as a text is important. Uh, it's quite common to see 
very terse license declaration which says, oh, this is BSD or this is MIT. Good, except that there's potentially uh, 53 varieties or 57 actually varieties like ketchup of uh, MIT and BSD licenses. So it's important to have the text to make sure that we, we can comply correctly uh, with the terms and know these terms when we need to reuse the code. So for each of these five elements, we've assigned uh, a weight. And then we can compute these uh, automatically because they are factual, you know, there's no ambiguity. Um, and that's the, the essence of the, the, the scoring for license clarity. Now, if we run that on about 5,000 packages, like we, we talked about, the median score is, is really a bit all over the map. What we see that come out is that uh, gem, Ruby gems, node packages, and Python, PyPy packages tend to have a better uh, median a score than uh, Maven and Nugget packages. And uh, it's interesting too, by the way, because Maven and Nuggets are primarily being redistributed as binaries. And, and they're very often, literally based on anecdotal evidence, very often they're missing any license information whatsoever. So it's just a reflection of uh, anecdotal experience. Uh, the average uh, uh, is, doesn't do any better, but node packages actually do better on average. And what we see something, for instance, is a package that have been around for longer or package that have been uh, enforcing uh, some norms, such as gem with uh, using SPDX for license identifiers and, and NPMs have, of course, a much larger number of uh, packages that have an SPDX well-known license. Uh, that's uh, uh, an easy thing. Um, but also, this helps everywhere in terms of the clarity and the presence of a declared license, uh, where you see that uh, they both have very high score, very close to the ones which are in PyPy2, which tends to have a a well-defined set of metadata, but doesn't use SPDX. So they sometimes in Python, you get much more weird licenses. In most cases, you see how cross it is to get the corresponding license text. It's, it's actually a challenge uh, in all time, in all cases. If we look at uh, the, the breakdown by scoring elements in more details, you see where the, the, the biggest uh, winners are, and we see that, weirdly enough, there's, there's actually a better average license documentation at the file level in Maven. So it's cross at the top, better at the file level in Discord. Uh, whereas if you think at, uh, look at node packages, it's great at the top and pretty poor at the file level. We have also some statistics on 10 million packages, uh, but they, they just pretty much confirm what we see with the top level uh, packages. So there's no real surprise there, unfortunately. So now this is a mess, right? R really what this means is that based on all this data, you cannot consume code just by taking the declared license phase value. And you cannot consume code uh, without actually doing some extra work. And that just doesn't make sense. Not only it doesn't make sense, but everybody is redoing that work potentially uh, every time you're about to reuse code. Every time I'm, I'm about to use an open source package, I need to check its license. Well, maybe it's a, an occupational hazard on my side, but nevertheless. So there's three ways we can go about it. We can fix all the code, we can write better tools, and we can educate and fix with campaigns. So fix all the code. Uh, that's the approach taken by the clear defined project that uh, uh, that's uh, incubating at the OSI. Uh, what the project doing is scanning all the code, literally tens of millions of packages we scan code. It's computing the clarity score, and then it's 
there's a team of creators, literally people with uh, uh, well-versed in open source licensing that's, that are reviewing and creating all these licenses. Uh, the problem there is that it's likely to take forever to complete and it's a very centralized approach, which I think eventually uh, has a lot of difficulties to scale. As our approach is to write better tools, it's what I'm doing with scan code. And uh, so the approach is here to collect more and more uh, license examples and notice and text. And then apply machine learning to spot inconsistencies in the detection. So not really using machine learning for detection, but rather uh, spot issues from detection and use that also to inject more data, more samples to feed machine learning and, and AI. Um, it cannot, though, replace entirely human review, unfortunately. And the last way to think about how this can be fixed is using campaigns. So the example of the Linux kernel, which I mentioned at the very beginning, is, is, uh, is, is a good one, where we did a cleanup campaign focused strictly on the license kernel, which is about 70,000 files, and which was pretty messy in terms of licensing. There were over 700 different licenses, notices, just for the GPL. And so the, the work has been to uh, run massive scans on the kernel, uh, review them, and have a community uh, of uh, volunteers help uh, review all the license detection that were done and uh, adopt a shorter, cleaner, simpler SPX license identifier. Uh, in the end, today we have over 60,000 files that have a clear license and there were over a thousand different licenses together with the GPL license notices uh, before. We're, we're down now to about uh, uh, 61 license expression and probably below 70 different uh, license notice total. So that's a big win. You go from total mess to clarity. It took about two, uh, two and a half years, two years to get there. Um, but that's very efficient. So uh, another approach is to, to do some education and leverage. Uh, an example is the Python PEP 639, which I've started. It's a Python enhancement proposal at the Python Software Foundation. And what this Python proposal is about is to say, let's adopt SPDX license expression in Python package manifest metadata. It's very simple, nothing very uh, uh, complex. But it's 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 a community effort. It needs to be reviewed and approved by everyone. the The impact of that is eventually that instead of having a, a centralized approach like Clear Define, we delegate the work to every authors. We can provide them feedback when they're creating package and writing package manifest through the tooling that they're not using a proper, well-known, well-defined and clear license uh, information, that they're missing this and this license information. And we can then gently educate each of the authors before enforcing clarity. And enforcing clarity would mean uh, rejecting the publication of a package that doesn't meet these uh, strict criteria of, uh, of licensing clarity. And I think in the end, it's, it's a better approach because rather than uh, looking at one package at a time with a small team of volunteers, you're eventually looking at all the package involving every author at once. So the leverage there is, is significant and it's likely a much better approach. In the end, probably fixing tools, uh, some centralized and a lot of uh, decentralized uh, leverage community by community is likely the best. And that's pretty much it. So we'll be trying to start a, a campaign for uh, other communities to, to actually fix uh, the, the licensing. And uh, I look forward to, to discuss with you. Thank you very much. And now we'll take some uh, questions.